Hello students, it's Dr. Sansom here. I just wanted to make a quick video for you to talk about how to study for Chem 106 and how to be effective and successful. So first one, um, you've got Alex and Alex is super useful, especially the part that's called the objective. So I know you're already familiar with homeworks, right? That's your assignment that's due. But for each week where you have like a homework one, you also have objective one. An objective one has all the same content and topics and ideas as homework one, but it's like a free reign. You get to do as many problems as you need to do in order to get it correct. So um, those are a great way to get extra practice. And especially it's smart to work on those a little bit as you're going through the week so that your homework is really easy by the end of the week. If you've done all the objectives, then you already know how to do all those problems. So you'll get to the homework and it's just like quick check of everything that you've already learned. Another um, idea is to potentially review the whole objective for the week on Monday as a kind of a preview of what's coming up in the class for the week. Uh, one of our TAs actually mentioned that that was something that they did when they were in the class. Um, instead of reading the book, and I don't recommend that, okay, we're gonna get to that in a minute, but <laughs> he said he would do them on Monday and kind of work through them, take notes on things he didn't understand, get to know the equations that we were gonna use, start to see what kinds of problems we were gonna see. And that was a huge help, just sort of um, as a preview of the week. Okay, number two, um, the, work until you can do 10 problems in a row without making a mistake. Okay, now I say 10, it could be five, you, you know, but 10 is like a good round number. Um, and the reason I say that is when you do a problem on Alex especially, because it gives you multiple tries, but also in recitation when you can talk to your group, or in class when you're talking to your group or you get corrected or you can try again, right? In all of those situations, you can try again. And on your exam, you can't try again. You get one try, right? And so you want to try to keep track of things that you're missing. Um, if you miss a problem or you need to get help or you just get it on the third try or something like that, then that means you need to practice enough so that you can get it consistently right on the first try. Alex is really great for this because they force you to do three problems in a row before they let you move on. So you've got to get it right and got to be consistent about it before they let you move on. Um, and also, it'll force you to keep doing it over and over again if you are making mistakes. Now I just want to point out, if you can't do 10 problems in a row without making a mistake, let's say you do six problems in a row, um, without making a mistake, but you make mistakes on four of them out of the 10 that you've done. That's like getting a 60% on your exam, right? So if you do 10 and you get all of them right, then you can feel very confident that you're going to be like in the 90 to 100 percent range on that specific kind of topic, right? So that's why I say 10. You want to kind of keep track. How am I doing on my first try? And if you're doing great, like eight or nine out of 10, then that's good enough for you, then that's good. But if you're doing like four or five or six out of 10, you just wanna think that's actually not so good in terms of your grade on an exam when you only get one try. So that's the second thing. Third thing, okay, as you're doing your problems, you're gonna be making mistakes. Now, I just wanna emphasize that Everybody makes mistakes when they're learning something new. That's like literally how you learn everything, right? So you shouldn't be surprised at all or like disappointed in yourself that you're making mistakes because that's normal. But what do people do when they're learning? They learn to not make those mistakes, right? Not repeat the same mistake over and over again. As you're doing your problems, make sure that you're keeping track. And this is a little bit annoying, but just like maybe a margin note, you know, on your, on your paper that you're working on, keep track of the mistakes that you're making. You know, the common ones. I didn't turn the temperature to Kelvin. I didn't take into account kilojoules and joules. I used the wrong R value. Um, you know, I mixed up my pairs of points. I forgot what normal boiling point meant. Any of those things, right? As you encounter them, just write them down, okay? And you'll start to see a pattern. Maybe you notice gosh, algebra errors are getting me on like half of these problems. I've had algebra errors. And now you know, okay, I need to be really careful with my algebra. I'm going to make sure that I write out every step 
and I'm super careful and meticulous in my work with my algebra. Or, you know, maybe it's a different mistake that you're making, but you can kind of identify those mistakes and then you create a sort of checklist. Like um, as you're doing a problem on the exam, you can say, okay, did I check for Kelvin? Did I check for joules? Did I check for R? Did I check my algebra, right? And then you can sort of avoid those mistakes in the future. So um, keep track of the mistakes that you make and use it to prevent yourself from making those same mistakes again. Okay, number four. And this is one of the reasons why you're in a group is actually because when you start saying something, teaching it to somebody else, trying to explain it in your own words, you will realize when you don't understand things. Now, some of you are just going to be naturally like less inclined to speak out in your group, but it's super important that you do that. So if you have one person in your group that maybe is the one who's like always explaining things, maybe when they finish explaining something and you haven't said anything yet, you say, hey, would it be okay if I tried explaining that back to you? And that way it's coming out of your brain, right? So you can start to see immediately if there's something that you don't fully understand because you won't be able to explain it. Or if you think you understand it and they recognize, oh, that's not quite right, then they can actually help you correct any misconceptions that you have. But nobody can do any of that if you don't speak up. So make sure that you're participating. Um, actively. Make sure that in your group, everyone is participating. If you're the one who's speaking all the time, maybe like ask the person who's not speaking, hey, what did you think about that? How would you explain it? Okay, so try and distribute the speaking time in your group so that everyone is getting a chance to practice. Um, number five, this is an unpopular opinion, you guys, but I'm going to tell you, I want you to read the book before you come to class, before you come to class. This is why chemistry is hard and you're not gonna understand it the first time you see it. You just aren't, it's okay, that's normal, it's hard. But if the first time you see it is in class, you're gonna feel really, really confused and sad and like overwhelmed. Instead, if you read the book before you come to class, even though the book won't make sense to you, even though it's gonna be hard to read it, but if you read the book before you come to class, then when you come to class, you can get your questions answered. You can understand things better. Things are going to click for you as you're in class because you'll be like, oh, that's what that was trying to say. I get it now. Right? So doing that effort, even though it's hard, even though it doesn't fully make sense, it is not a waste of time because you are priming your brain to have it click and make sense when you're in class. And my very best students every year do this. Uh, they're always reading the textbook. Okay, so make sure you're doing that too. Number six, output is better than input. So think about this for a minute. There's a variety of different learning activities we can do where like stuff is coming into our brains. Uh, for example, like watching a video, reading the textbook, listening to lecture, something like that, right? Stuff is coming in. But on the test, what happens? We have to have stuff come out. We're going to be writing problems down. We're going to be writing explanations. We're going to have to have information coming out of our head, okay? So as you're planning your study time, think about the balance of those things. You have to have ways that you get information, right? That's important too. But you also need to plan in time for practice, both doing problems and explaining ideas and concepts. Um, so make sure that you're doing that in your study time. Alex, another plug for Alex, the objectives are great for this, for any of the kind of multiple choice type questions. And all of your group work is great for this in terms of like free response type questions. So you do have that built into the structure of the class for you, but make sure if you're trying to like put in extra study time that you're not just spending it like rereading the class notes or like watching Khan Academy. You can do that if there's something that you're like, I really don't understand that, but don't stop there. Then go on and find the practice problems and do the practice problems. So you have practice time built into your study where you have output happening. Number seven, this is seeking help, getting help. 
Get help early and often. This is the thing. Chem 106 is super cumulative. Obviously, you've already seen this with stuff from 105. We're expecting you to like know that and be comfortable with it. So here's the deal. If you ever have a day and you're like, I don't know how to do that. Like, um, you know, with this last um, exam, people afterwards were like, huh, I guess I never really knew how to do intermolecular forces. Well, like we talked about intermolecular forces during class. So if that happens and you're like, huh, I don't think I really know how to do the intermolecular forces. Don't just like let it slide, right? Write it down, put a star next to it, and then go and get help. Say, I don't know how to find intermolecular forces. Can you help me? And um, I can help you. The TAs can help you. We have our TAs. We have the other TAs that are in the tutorial lab. There's a ton of people here that are here to help you. There's also resources like um, the YSERV tutors, which is free tutoring. Um, there are paid tutors that you can get, you know, through the chemistry office. They have a list. So if you want to have extra help in a different way, you can get that as well. But we are literally here to help you. We want you to be successful. We want to explain things to you. We want to help you succeed. And the sooner you do that, the better because it's going to keep coming back and uh, being a pesky nuisance until you take care of it. The thing that you ignore is going to continue bothering you uh, until you take care of it. So just take care of it. If something's confusing, get help right away. Um, that is going to be, that's like the best advice I can give you. I want to give you a few other um test specific things, okay? So when you're thinking about the, the exams, first, if we're doing multiple choice, I recommend that you cover up all the answer choices and do that problem as if it were a free response question and make sure you check all the things that you would make mistakes on just the same way you would do if there was nothing there given to you, okay? And then you check the answers. The reason is, all the answers that are there that are not the right answer are there for a reason. Like I know the mistakes you're gonna make if you're not being careful and that's why we put those answers there, okay? And so you can't just like be like, oh good, I got an answer that's on the list because you can get those answers doing it wrong, right? That's how the wrong answers get there. That's how you, that's, that's how multiple choice questions are written generally. <laughs> uh, the wrong answers are there uh, to distract you um, and, and be, um, what's the word, like compelling. They should feel like they're possible answers, right? Um, so be aware of that. Treat them like free response and then check everything and then go and look at the answers and make sure that you've got it, okay? Um, that's the first thing. Second thing, sometimes I get students in here who are like, try, they look at the question and then they're like trying to twist it around and like, does it mean this? Does it mean that? I'm not sure, you know? If you ever find yourself in a situation and you're like, huh, is that a trick? You should just know that my philosophy generally is that I am not, not, not trying to trick you, okay? Uh, I'm not, that is not my goal. The questions are supposed to be straightforward. Some of them are hard, yes, but they shouldn't, they're not there to trick you. The answer choices aren't there to trick you. Um, it, so if you're twisting it around in your head and like mulling over it and whatever, try to read whatever it would be just if, as simply stated as it's there in the words so that you can, under, you can understand that and, and just whatever is the simplest way to interpret it, that's the way that you should interpret it. The third thing for exams is there's always going to be a balance of like calculations and also conceptual or explaining type questions. Um, and so if you're really good at one and not so good at the other, as you're preparing, make sure that you're practicing the thing that you're not good at. Sometimes it feels really nice to practice things that you're good at because you're good at them and you're like, yes, I'm so good at chemistry, right? Um, but you have to do the things that you're not good at, right? Because that's those are the things that are going to get you. So you've got to make sure you're practicing both of those. Um, for any of the conceptual things, we do this in lecture. We talk in our groups. Where the purpose of that is for you to have a chance to explain it and to write out your explanation and, and work with that idea. Um, for Alex is where we're looking at like multiple choice kind of practices. If you're not good with multiple choice type things, use Alex. If you have trouble with calculations, um, Alex has tons of problems, but so does the, the end of the chapter in the book, whichever book you're using. 
They have extra practice problems. And you can go do as many of those as you need to do until you feel like 100% confident in both areas. So just make sure, even if you have a natural like affinity, I know that engineers like did the calculations and stuff like that, right? But if you have a natural affinity for one type or the other, make sure you're doing the one that you don't like also, um, so that you're going to be well-rounded when it comes to the exam. Okay. Those are my best study tips for Chem 106. I hope this is helpful to you. Um, I'm excited for you to be successful in the class and to learn lots of chemistry and look forward to seeing all of the success that you'll have in this class and in your life.